أسعد الله مساءكم شكرا لكم على انضمامكم إلينا في هذا المؤتمر الصحفي الثاني الذي يحدث في اليوم الأول من هذه القمة أرجو أن تكونوا قد At the World Economic Forum, Martina will give a very brief overview of the top 10 trends and any any emerging or, or particularly dynamic worries or concerns we need to think about. Then I'm very pleased to be joined by the, Thomas Ilves, the President of Estonia, one of the most tech uh, networked countries and tech ready economies in the world, who may perhaps talk about the opportunities that technology can play in addressing some of the global challenges that we're here to talk about. Following from Mr. Ilves, Jose Manuel Barroso, President of the European Commission 2004 to 2014 and a member of the Global Agenda Councils on the Future of Regional Organizations, who will talk uh, a little bit about the European perspective on the outlook. And uh, last but not least by any means, Majid Jafar, Chief Executive Officer of Crescent Petroleum here in the United Arab Emirates, able to talk about the regional implications for these challenges. So uh, hopefully we'll run through those and still have time for um, questions afterwards. I I'd like to kick off now by asking Martina to say a few words. Thanks, Holly. And good morning, everyone. Um, we're very excited to present the report uh, to you. It's our fourth edition. And what we're finding this, this year by, by polling over 1,700 people from, from our community is that the global agenda is much more shaped by a uh, global um, uh, geopolitical situation which is really strained this year. We've seen it in events uh, uh, in, in East Asia, in the Ukraine, in Russia, of course, and the Middle East as well. Um, and what is really new here is, is a much more complexity and volatility in the situation. Um, the other issues that, that are top on the agenda and really are topping the concerns of our experts are inequality and the risk of jobless growth. It, these are the two major trends and risks that our community sees on the agenda for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, what is really um, interesting here is that these socioeconomic trends are creating a dangerous cycle. The lack of employment and stagnant uh, wages are contributing to rising inequality and as well as holding back consumer spending and ultimately growth, which creates you know, more problems down the road for, for many of the countries that are faced with this. And it's really a truly global phenomenon, which is so interconnected. And while we're seeing maybe a better economic integration across the world, there's much more fragmentation on political level, which in turn creates also a very, very vicious cycle and, and much more independent, interdependence across the world, but also much bigger risks because no one's in charge and there's no, there's no leadership, which leads me to the third most important trend this year, which is lack of global leadership. Uh, this was, again, uh, a major, major issue and was actually the, the fastest rising issue in this year's report. It's, it's jumped from number seven last year to number three this year. So a significant jump in terms of what matters to people uh, in our community and what they see as the major issues going forward. It's also one of the issues that I think connects so many of the other trends, from inequality, all the economic trends, but also geopolitical ones, but also health, as we've seen with the recent uh, Ebola crisis. This lack of leadership and global leadership is, is a real problem. Uh, some other interesting dimensions maybe in the top 10 is uh, the list uh, related to the environmental issues. We have uh, a large number of, of issues actually or trends that we think uh, matter on the environmental agenda. One is the increased water stress, particularly for this region, obviously a key issue. Um, the other ones relate to the increasing occurrence of severe weather events, an issue that's much more prominent now around the world, but particularly in Asia. And also um, uh, the rising pollution in the developing world. Again, something very prominent in Asia, particularly. And what is also new this year is the, um, the feature of health. We've never had health featured in our top 10 trends, and this is the first year we have mentions of the growing importance of health in the economy. 
and with some of the pandemics that, that we've seen recently uh, from the Ebola crisis to others rising on the agenda, it's clearly very timely to have that feature in, in, in the report. And this brings me also to today and this uh, you know, event that we're here. These are all going to be the basis for discussions <laughs> amongst our 1,000 participants who will join us to really try and understand some of the dimensions and complexities of these issues but also to try to come up with innovative ideas and solutions which can move the dial on some of these issues as we've seen in the past, this network has already done. Thank you. It's a dark prognosis, but let's hear about some of the solutions. President Ilves, you're uh, the head of state, one of the, the most um, tech savvy um, countries in the, in the world. Give us your views on how technology can be leveraged to address some of the challenges we're looking at here. Okay. Before I, get, before I talk about the, the solutions, I'd say that uh, one, I think one of the co paradoxes we're in is that we're actually dealing with, once again, with 19th century problems with rise, say the rise of China, uh, with uh, the metastasization of Al-Qaeda into ISIS. I mean, these are all really 19th century problems. Um, and then, of course, the, the other way we're looking, which is hope forward, is that uh, at the rate, the rate of technological growth um, today is so great uh, that it's, um, there's a whole wealth of possibilities. I mean, I, what I think we are seeing, to put it in a nutshell, is that those of you who know what Moore's Law is, that every one and a half years, the power of computing per unit price doubles. Uh, and if you recall the old story about how chess was created and the, um, the Shah asked the creator of chess, how much do you want? And he said, oh, a grain uh, on the first square, two grains on the second, and four on the third. And the Shah thought, oh, that's no problem, except by the time they got to the 32nd, would have gotten to the 32nd square, that would have included all of the uh, <clears throat> rice in the world. Now, the same thing is happening in technology. Uh, I spoke recently before the European Parliament, a small committee, and I said, by the time you people are running for election again in four and a half years, computers will be eight times faster for the same price. Think about that. So what we can see now, this enormous explosion of the power of computing in ways that no one could have predicted before. The positive side of this in terms of, say, even health care, being able to track, uh, to track the genome, being able to track uh, uh, major medical issues. Uh, we've already seen Google be a better predictor of the flu than uh, any, other, any other source, any medical source. The power of data and data processing, more importantly, uh, is going to allow us to do things we have never been able to do to make life better uh, than ever before. But even this has a downside, because uh, what um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, Jeremy Rifkin wrote a book called The End of Work, in which he predicted that people will be losing their jobs because of uh, computers and automatization. But I think he wrote the book 20 years too early because at that time computers were not that powerful. Uh, this year, Andrew McAfee, who's actually featured in this um, Global Agenda book himself, uh, published a new book uh, basically saying the same thing. And this time it's uh, looking like it's true, which is that uh, the way technology, especially with, under Moore's law, is advancing, um, in 10 years, maybe we won't need taxi drivers anymore. And Mercedes or Mercedes is already uh, producing a driverless truck that will completely revolutionize the way we drive. Now, if you think about what that means, that, uh, that there will be a huge hollowing out of jobs. There will be high-tech jobs, and then there will be people who work figuratively in McDonald's because no computer can produce a Big Mac. But in between, more and more jobs with this uh, dramatic increase in computing power will be uh, better performed often than by human beings. And so this will lead to an even greater degree of income inequality, which then I guess leads me to say that what we need to do is to really rethink our approach to education. 
there will be no jobs in the future that will not be impacted by the latest in high technology, especially in computing. Uh, if we do not, if we do not really think more about what is in the U.S. is called the STEM subject, science, technology, engineering, and math, and making that uh, a greater part of our <coughs> curricula, uh, we will find uh, life uh, in the future uh, really very, very sort of binary. Either you know something about technology and can deal with it or you do not, in which case you will be left out uh, or you will have only low paying jobs. I mean, that's a bleak vision, but I think that's something we can avoid if we start paying attention now to the right kind of uh, education, which is in many ways quite different from what uh, we have been used to in the past. Mr. Barroso, I can think of few people better qualified to offer a perspective from Europe on the trends and challenges outlined in the outlook on the global agenda. Thank you. First of all, let me say it's great to be here in Dubai and have this opportunity to have three days to think, <laughs> to think and to interact with very, very bright people. Uh, in fact, when you look at the trends that have been presented, some of them very worrying, um, we see that this is happening in Europe but indeed some of those problems are common to the rest of the world. Namely, the two trends that have been signaled, so deepening income inequality and persistent jobless growth. And of course this is having today a very negative impact in Europe. Why? Because it has been, in fact, uh, one of the causes for um, what is perceived as the weakening of representative democracy, the intensifying nationalism, including sometimes xenophobic movements, uh, and this is of course a matter uh, of concern. So my first point is the following. While in Europe the economy is probably going to improve, the politics may become more difficult. We have basically solved, I think, the issue of stability. So we are much better now than during the financial crisis, but because of the relatively low growth and because of perception of inequality, it will not be a surprise if, while the economic problems get smaller, the political problems get bigger. It can appear as a paradox, but it is not a paradox. So we are in a situation of transition uh, where, in fact, the perception of lack of leadership is in increasing. Why? because governments are seen no, lo uh, not yet, uh, no longer able to solve the problems, the so-called man of the street, the common citizen feel, but while the regional or the international organizations are not yet ready to do it. And, uh, and this is in fact one of the concerns we have also globally. Because indeed, some of those global problems we are facing from international terrorism to uh, climate change, it's quite obvious that uh, a national government on its own cannot solve them. But we are not yet in a situation where the global community has the instruments to solve those, those problems. So we are, to some extent, I believe, in a transitional phase with a lot of uh, anxiety. And uh, uh, this is increasing problems of legitimacy because the problems of legitimacy are linked to the perception of lack of effectiveness. A citizen in the streets looks to the situation and says they are not delivering. They, I mean, they, those who have power, be it in the governments, be it sometimes in the uh, supranational institutions, they are not able to deliver. And that's why, for instance, we are seeing increasing nationalist attitudes, xenophobic, anti-migration movements, in fact, I've contributed to this uh, outlook with an article on migration that does not appear as one of the 10 uh, most important trends, I will say, probably because those who are responding have no problems with freedom of movement. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you many people have problems. 5,700 5, people have died in the Mediterranean recently. And uh, we are seeing even in traditionally very open countries like Britain, uh, now resistance 
not only to migration, but even to freedom of movement inside the European Union. And this is linked with the, ri the, the rise of nationalistics, or at least uh, uh, xenophobic, or sometimes uh, even, um, let's say, parochial forces. So this is a matter, I think, for all those, a concern for all th those of us that care about a sense of fairness. And we believe that these basic freedoms, including the freedom of movement, is important uh, in today's world. And uh, this is why I believe the report, this outlook, in fact, gives us a lot of food for thought. And I really hope that these three days of reflection will come with some solutions. For me, the solution is leadership. Leadership, so first of all, political choices that are well informed, but also leaders that have the courage to take decisions that sometimes are not popular in the short term. Uh, before we go to our last panelist, I'd just like to mention that we do have a hard finish at half past. We all have to get ready for the opening plenary, so start thinking about your questions <coughs> now. I'm just going to turn very briefly now to uh, our final panelist before that, that Q&A session starts. Majid Jaffa, I was the head of a successful business organization based here in the Gulf. What kind of impact uh, are you seeing of these trends outlined in the report? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, what is interesting, despite the fact that media headlines tend to be dominated by conflict and geopolitical tensions, the 1,000 plus uh, experts across the uh, councils clearly have prioritized socioeconomic uh, issues and deepening income inequality and persistent jobless growth being the top two. And turning to the Middle East region, and again, despite uh, conflict in the region, the number one issue uh, highlighted is the persistent youth unemployment. Uh, it's close to 30%. It's been a chronic problem in the region for some decades now, but actually combined with the political upheavals and the world economic crisis, it's become uh, an acute problem and, and it's, it's worsening. And fundamentally, the uh, economic progress is required for the political stability. Uh, the causes are uh, the same as everywhere, uh, including Europe or Africa or other regions that are affected by this issue, which are insufficient economic growth, the skills and education mismatch, and uh, rigid labor markets. Uh, and I think looking at, at this problem and uh, the trends overall, uh, it's clear why not only such a report, but this sort of multi-stakeholder approach is required. These are problems that you can't tackle only in government or only in the private sector or only in the academic uh, sphere. And that's what is special about the summit on the global agenda and, and the idea behind the councils is that over a thousand thought leaders will be meeting here in Dubai over the next three days in uh, over 80 different councils uh, and from a broad variety of backgrounds. I mean, my own council on the Middle East, North Africa region has a former prime minister, former minister, senior officials from international financial institutions, academics, business leaders, who get together in an intense environment for three days, once a year. Uh, we also have uh, monthly virtual uh, meetings, but this is really the annual uh, meeting, to try and come up with innovative ways to not only analyze these challenges, but, but come up with concrete solutions for tackling these uh, challenges. Uh, speaking uh, from the UAE point of view, we're of course honored that, uh, to welcome the summit again here and the UAE, and particularly here in Dubai, you see how openness, uh, globalism, and economic dynamism uh, is an important solution to many of these uh, challenges, particularly looking at the uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa region. Uh, and of course, the UAE has, has always been proud to be that bridge between the, uh, the East uh, and the West. So from a private sector perspective from here and, and the region, uh, we're very uh, honored to play a part and uh, it's a, a sort of corporate oblig responsibility, a moral responsibility to have the private sector's voice actively heard uh, and helping s shape some of the solutions. And it's interesting to see from the report also the different confidence level in different institutions. Uh, and clearly, as Mr. Barroso has said, there is a challenge of 
or crisis of confidence in leadership, and particularly uh, in governments in many parts of the world. Thank you, okay, let's have a quick show of hands before we, we do Q&A. So, uh, okay, let's try to do two in the remaining seven minutes. The, this gentleman here first, could you please give us your name and your affiliation and also make sure that your question is relevant to the outlook. If you have specific questions to any speaker, they are available throughout the summit. Sure. Thank you. My name is Peter Vanham. Uh, here reporting for the FT uh, on emerging markets. So a question for Mr. Barroso, um, talking about the lack of leadership or the perception of it, um, which are the organizations that you think in the future are best suited to provide that leadership? Um, how, what is the road to get there and, and when will we get to uh, leadership of those organizations? According to, the, to this survey, it's interesting to see that um, the first, naturally, the more popular are non-profit and charitable organizations. That does not should be, that should not be a surprise. But international organizations are in the fourth place and governments are in the seventh place. And according to our own uh, data in the European Union, the so-called Eurobarometer, we have seen that even if the European institutions are now also um, facing a crisis of confidence, to be honest, the crisis of confidence, on average, it depends on the countries, is bigger uh, when it comes to national politicians than to supranational uh, ones. So, so I believe that we need stronger mechanisms of global governance. And I believe that uh, to reach that level, the regional level is very important. For instance, what we can do at European level, we do through the European Union, what Southeast Asia can do is through ASEAN, um, African Union, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council, for instance, uh, Mercosul, and uh, in fact, I'm chairing one of the, uh, the, the Global Council on these matters now. That's, uh, and uh, I think we should do more that there because it's, um, we are not yet ready, at least the global community, to, to um, let's say, a mechanism of global governance, even if you have, of course, the United Nations. This is the basis of legitimacy, but as we have seen, when there was a real crisis, it, it was necessary to create a G20. So, because G8 was considered too small, but United Nations too big, that's why we went to the, to the G20. But the regional organizations can be a useful step towards global governance, filling the gaps, where, by the way, we can make better this interaction with the business and the private sector. Because it's quite clear that today, the so-called formal um, leadership, they are, this is not enough. We need to engage more with the private sector and the civil society. Uh, this is a concern we have today. And without addressing this issue, the problem of legitimacy is going to increase. So representative democracy, at least in Europe, I believe it's indispensable. But we need to complete um, uh, region, um, representative democracy with other uh, links with the civil society and also with the private sector, and of course, uh, deepening our cooperation uh, also at, at regional level. And these lessons or these experiences, I think, can be useful. And in fact, they have been studied by other parts of the world. Thank you, Kay. And we're just going to take one more question from the front. This gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. One, Director Larkin, please. Um, the growing inequality in income, how do you, as you say in the report that um, East Asia will be specifically suffering from growing inequality in uh, income. How do you see the responses from China? Yesterday, uh, President Xi Jinping um, pledged 40 billion for the Silk Road investment to increase infrastructure. Is this enough, the right step? And question to Mr. To Excellency Mr. Barroso, Will you, how is Europe's response to the rise of East Asia as an economic powerhouse, as the report also states? Uh, by the way, my name is Gerard Elfiel, Xinhua News Agency, Dubai. Great, thank you. Um, so when we, we talk about Asia more generally, so it's not related to just China, it's really all Asian nations. And uh, we're seeing this as a major issue because they're obviously you know, coming out of, 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 of many of the developing 
uh, countries and they're starting now their growth path. So uh, there is a natural link to their growing middle, middle class and what this means now to the larger growth of their economies. Um, clearly, you know, infrastructure investments are going to be very much needed and they're, they're going to be key to, to putting them on the right path. But when you look at the, the responses also, when we look at what are the solutions that are needed for, for bridging this gap in, in terms of inequality, education is the number one aspect of this. And while education isn't mentioned as one of the top trends, it, if we look at the responses in terms of solutions, it's, it's almost featured in every single trend, that we need much better education and much more substantial investments and funding into education that's fit for the new century, not just you know from the past. And, and I think we have a very outdated education system that needs real reform and, and a new look at not only how technology plays into it, but also how it can really be adapted to the skills that are required on the job and labor market and, and what this means for how we educate our, our people. Um, that will be my, my take on this. Uh, regarding uh, the rise of Asia and how Europe is reacting to it, I think it was your question, uh, we have been reacting to it. In fact, Europe remains the biggest economy in the world, biggest even than the United States, and much bigger than China, but of course the trend is different. The trend is China being the biggest winner of globalization, and that explains why the European Union last years have been investing so much uh, in uh, uh, trade uh, with uh, uh, Asia. In fact, the first agreement of new generation on trade was made with South Korea. And uh, we have now negotiated, uh, we are now given a very big impulse to Japan. Uh, we, have, um, we are very close to conclude with Vietnam. Uh, we are negotiating now an uh, investment agreement uh, uh, with China. So certainly we are perfectly aware of the rise of uh, Asia, which by the way is good for Asia because many people were uh, able to get out of, of poverty, in some cases extreme poverty. For instance, what happened in China, it's really inspiring, I think, also for other parts of the world from that point of view. Uh, but uh, we believe, at least I believe, that it, is, um, it can be and should be a win-win for the global economy. Uh, and so, and, but that's something that is, to be honest, controversial. There are people uh, uh, in the developed economies, not only in Europe but the United States, that look at the rise of China and the rise of Asia as a threat. And uh, <laughs> let's be honest about this. So can we make it a win-win? Can we make it, of course, good for the countries themselves, but also for global economy, for sustainable growth? I believe we should do everything to make that um, a very important contribution for sustainable growth. And so far, I think it has been a very important contribution for grows globally. I get the feeling we could go on for hours, but we can't, unfortunately. We have an opening plenary when you need to get your seats and our, uh, our panel here needs to get their seats too. So I'm going to close now. Just to remind you, our panelists are here for, for the coming three days and will be available um, for interview. Just come and uh, see us in the media center if you want to put a request in. Thanks very much for joining us and, and thank you as well for joining us here today.